Okay. So thank you, Ellie, for that uh, generous introduction. Um, thank you for BHS for inviting me to talk tonight. Uh, I'm I'm delighted to see so many here in the room and and also so many online. As you know, tonight I'm talking about the successful impact of changing philosophy and methods of charity campaigning with respect to disability rights and benefits from 1970 to 2010. Briefly, a few points on definitions. Campaigning is taken here as working to change the attitudes and behaviors of the statutory, commercial and voluntary sectors and the general public towards their causes. And lobbying is similar, but more narrowly targeted at policy makers and decision makers, primarily in government. The second definition point is that the descriptors of disabled people have changed dramatically over time. I tend to use the descriptors of the time period, but if I offend, it's obviously unintentional. I apologize in advance. Finally, I'm not going to mention the many references in the paper because that would just slow us down a lot, but there are many. <coughs> So the overall structure, what I'm going to say, I start with considering the growth of charity lobbying and campaigning from 1970 to 2020. I then move on to how the campaign and lobbying was affected by the changing philosophical approaches. I then look at six relevant methods, which seem to me to have had quite a big impact on the expansion of campaigning over the, the 40 years. With I look at the impact of the decline in the legal and political opposition to charity campaigning. So that's the four sections. I hope you can spot them as we go through. I've been to many lectures where I've been told there are four sections. <laughs> when I've been listening to it, I've got rather lost. So I'll try and see when we get to a different point. As a subject of such dramatic change, lobbying and campaigning across the sector came to the fore in my mind while writing the history of RNIB from 1970 to 2010, entitled Vision Changing Charity, RNIB in Socio-Political Context. In that book, I amplify much of what I shall obviously mention tonight. Uh, you all know how hard it is to sell history books, so I make no apologies of shamelessly promoting my book tonight by telling you you can purchase it here for Half price, £12.50, not £25. I can take electronic payment. And for those of you online, here is my mobile number on the screen, 07-967-007-642. And if you text me, I'll honour the £12.50 price. It seems sensible to start by looking at the extent of the growth of charity lobbying and campaigning. That's the first section. I'll start by looking at campaigning and then I'll move on to lobbying. Measuring comprehensively and accurately the quantity of charity lobbying over the 40 years is challenging, nigh impossible in my view, but its nature, by its nature, it is discreet, not always visible. So I start here with a more modest aim to indicate the growth of charity lobbying via a surrogate indicative measure, namely the number of charity backed all party parliamentary groups, APPGs, in the 1970s compared with 2020. It's a credible measure of lobbying because a charity supporting an APPG is self evidently involved in lobbying parliament and almost certainly government departments. It will be an underestimate because other charities will be lobbying politicians and civil servants without supporting an APPG. I presented this research at the VSSN conference at Sheffield Hallam University in September 2023, and here I'm simply going to give the headlines. In the early 1970s, the number of charity-backed APPGs was in the low single figures, probably two. In establishing this figure, I consulted charity people active in lobbying at the time, and I wish to record my gratitude to Helen Donoghue, Patricia Hewitt, Ruth Lister, Amanda Jordan and Brian Lamb. In fact, I think Helen and Patricia and Amanda are probably online at this moment. So thank you to, to you three. 40 years later, the situation was dramatically different. My analysis of the official parliamentary registers 
of the 413 subject focused APPGs in 2020 found not two, but 64 supported by charities. So now on to look at campaigning growth. I started writing this paper assuming it would be easy to find quantitative evidence of campaigning growth, growth, but it hasn't. So if any of you know of any studies, I should be very grateful if we could talk, but here follows some substantial anecdotal evidence. One of the most comprehensive and thoughtful academic books describing charity in the late 60s and early 70s is Charities by Benedict Nightingale, published in 1973. It supports the view that charities did live. Between 1970 and 72, he drew evidence from over 300 charities and wrote this up, devoting hundreds of pages of descriptions of service delivery and fundraising, but virtually nothing on campaigning just 14 of those many, many pages. Clearly, some charities were campaigning and lobbying back then, and I shall describe some of them tonight. But it's not contentious to say that in the early 70s, campaigning and lobbying made up a small part of charity activity. And since then, there has been a very major growth. <laughs> also bear in mind that many of the apparently charitable campaigners back then were not charities. For example, Amnesty International, the United Nations Association, Liberty, then called the National Council of Civil Liberties, the anti-apartheid movement, and DIG, the Disablement Income Group. None of those were charities. One quantitative measure which might help would be identifying the growth of numbers of staff dedicated to campaigning. I haven't found any such studies, so help please again. I know that in 1971, for example, Age Concern England had one and a half posts. By 1975, four years later, the number was four and a half, and there were at least 10 and almost certainly more when they merged with Help the Aged in 2009. In RNIB in 1983, there were four campaigning and communications posts devoted to campaigning and lobbying. By 1997, just, just over a decade later, that had risen to 14 campaign policy posts supported by 10 communications posts. That is from four to 24 in just over a decade. So having discussed growth, I'm now onto the second section, which is on campaigning and lobbying <clears throat> as it is affected by the changing philosophical approaches of charities during that period. I'm going to take a drink, but this is slightly embarrassing because we couldn't find a cup, and I've got a very large bottle. I assure you, this is pure still water. <laughs> this is all part of my image projection. <laughs> so back in the early period, say 1970 to 1985, one theme in particular fundamentally impacted not just charity campaigning, but hold charities in the social welfare sphere of old people, children, mental health, abuse, disability, the list is endless. It was a shift from a permissive welfare approach to a rights approach, from a permissive welfare approach to a rights approach. So how did this idea come about and have such impact? Back in the 1970s, the dominant focus of charity was direct service delivery to beneficiaries, amelioration rather than cure or prevention. <clears throat> of trustees and staff, very few would have come from the charity beneficiary group. For example, very few deaf people in deaf charities, few blind people in blind charities. That is not to underestimate how much good was being done, but that good was decided by a few people who were not among the beneficiary group. The good was permissive, not rights-based. Beneficiaries were not stakeholders defined as people with power and authority. Also in the late 60s and early 70s, that was a period when the caring workforce in the welfare state, carers for children, old people, physically disabled, etc., were professionalizing. These workforces were emulating the traditional professionalism model whereby one generation of experts passed on their expertise to the next generation and validated this expertise 
before they could qualify. This approach was epitomized in the Seabone Report of 1968 and the Social Services Act of 1970. So when it came to beneficiaries, clients, members, stakeholders, patients, call them what fits best, there was a widespread feeling that charities and experts, quotes, knew best, end quotes. However, change was coming. By way of contrast, in the 60s, in the wider nonprofit world of civil rights, student activism, homosexuality, feminism, campaigning by those directly affected was the norm. Similarly, disabled people were beginning to organize into campaigning groups and increasingly demand change for rights, not welfare. For example, the Disability Income Group was founded in 1965, the Association of Disabled People in 1971, the Union of Physically Impaired Against Segregation in 1972, and somewhat earlier, but radicalized in the late 60s, the National Federation of the Blind, the NFB. In the wider social welfare sector, Jack Jones, on retiring from the TGU, w, TGWU, set up a National Pensioners Forum in the early 70s, run by pensioners. The foundings of these and other of disabled people led to the terminology distinguishing between charities of and charities for. That is, charities of comprising and led by disabled people and charities for where disabled people were only in a minority. <clears throat> As an exemplar of this shift from welfare to rights, in 1970, 8% of RNAB's trustees were representative blind. Through active rights campaigning led by the NFB, later joined by the National League of the Blind and Disabled, just five years later, that figure had risen from 8% to 25%. A fascinating campaign win by a tiny David with one member of staff against the 3,000 staff Goliath of RNIB. And by 2001, it was over 50%, qualifying RNIB to become an organization of blind people. I describe obviously this in some detail and how that happened in Vision Changing Charity. Still staying with philosophy, I'd like to go on about the impact of the medical and social models of liberation, especially as they relate to disability because they buttressed the shift from welfare to rights and demanded societal change through campaigning. Emerging in the middle 70s, full-blown in the 80s, the disability charity world was engaged in a fierce policy debate within itself and with the outside world, especially government. For the movement of people with physical disabilities, the social model became dogma an analysis which had some similarities with the nature versus nurture debate in psychology and sociology at the time. In the social model, disabled people do not have a problem. It is society which has and is the problem. It is a society, it, it, it is society which has and is the problem by not adapting itself to include people with disabilities, by leaving barriers in place, such as steps into buildings and buses. The movement of rejected what they called the medical model. That is, it is disabled people who have the problem which medical science can mitigate and hopefully in due course cure or prevent. In my observation, the heart of the social model movement was disabled people's valid wish graduating into a demand to be in control of their lives rather than be sorted out by well-meaning non-disabled people. From RNIB, I worked hard to build bridges to the radical disability movement because of its validity, its energy, and its capacity. One of the best compliments I feel I ever received was from a physical disability leader who said, Ian, it's a pity you're not disabled because then you'd be one of us. Oliver, in 2004, argues that the publicly stated position of the social model of disability in the UK emanated in 1976 from a publication by the Union of Physically Impaired Against Segregation, UPIUS, when it published The Fundamentals of Disability. And in that 1976 publication, they quoted this, it is society which disables physically impaired people. 
disability is something imposed on top of our impairments by the way we are unnecessarily isolated and excluded from full participation in society. Disabled people are therefore an oppressed group in society. The analysis of social model of disability and the necessary role of having leaders with disability is widely accepted now. However, in the 70s, this was strong language, albeit true. When I was a child in the 50s, it was widely known that in a local house, the parents of Down syndrome boy kept him effectively locked up inside an upper room. He had been glimpsed, but never seen outside. In the 1960s, some disability charities had very large coin sculpt coin collecting boxes permanently chained outside shops sculptured in the shape of nearly full-sized children with leg iron supports in pathetic poses in the 70s the fundraising arms of charities regularly featured pathetic images of disabled people indeed some still do this leaflet with its pathetic image and strap line some of our patients have no one featuring a depressed, hopeless young man in a wheelchair, came as an insert in one of my professional magazines only two weeks ago. The Hospital of Neurodisability may have changed its name from the Hospital for Incurables, but it doesn't appear to have changed its attitudes. However, in the general scheme of things, by the time the UN year of the disabled person finished in 1992, the rights-orientated social model was well-recognized and established dogma. I now look <clears throat> at the third section, six relevant methods of charity campaigning and lobbying, and how these helped drive the expansion of campaigning and lobbying by charities. And for those who cannot see this slide, I'll be reading out the headings as we go. However, this is a Pandora's box, a wide variety and number of changing methods. Be valuable if in discussion, you could identify any qualitatively different campaigning methods which charities implemented, especially as those which the regulator, the Charity Commission, had previously prevented. But these six I'm going to present are my candidates for key methods which fueled the expansion of charity campaigning, particularly those that supply the oxygen of publicity. So the first method, increased participation of the recipients of charities' purposes. Nothing about us without us. By the 1980s, I'd estimate that most of the larger social welfare charities were including beneficiaries in their campaigns or were forming alliances with the relevant organizations of. For example, among disability for charities, by 1975, RNIB's chair and vice chair were blind and 25% of the trustees were blind, elected by organizations of blind people. By the 1980s, RNID had a profoundly deaf chief executive. While Mencap and Scope had been formed and run by parents of disabled children, by the 80s and 90s, they were involving people with learning difficulties and cerebral palsy in their campaigning. While supporters of the social model were not impressed by these changes, they were radical inside the four charities. Disabled people became involved in deciding and in particular implementing campaigns. For example, joining delegations to ministers, whereas before they had been excluded. Two, increasing in, the, increase in alliance campaigning. Charities are an intrinsic part of a capitalist society, so it's no surprise that competition for funds within charities is fierce. As campaigning became more common, this competition transferred over into campaigning as well, to the extent that it became counterproductive. By starting the late 60s, there was an increase in alliance campaigning in single cause areas such as housing and campaigning in multi cause areas such as disability. An outstanding example of the formation of new alliances in a single cause area was shelter in 1966-7, comprising the Notting Hill Housing Trust, Catholic Housing Aid Society and others, or with children, the National Children's Bureau in 1963. There's also the invigoration of pre-existing coordination alliances in single cause areas, for example, the National Old People's Welfare Council in 
relaunched as Age Concern in 1971, and the National Association of Mental Health as MIND in 1973. Also, previous single cause areas cooperating into multi cause the Disability Alliance in 1974. One dramatic example of this cause competition in the early 70s was the blindness lobby going it alone, campaigning for a blindness allowance at the same time as other disability charities were pressing their cases for financial support. This allowed the government to divide and rule and keep its costs down. So that when the mobility allowance for disabled people was decided in the middle 70s, it excluded blind people and it excluded people with learning difficulties. It took a, around a decade to heal the rifts between the impairment charities until 1987, Amanda Jordan from Scope and I proposed the formation of the Disability Benefits Consortium, the DBC. I'm going to mention DBC quite frequently, Dis Disability Benefits Consortium of some 500 disability charities. <clears throat> Importantly, the DBC built a strong bridge with the radical, radical phys physical disability of lobby through Richard Wood and of leader becoming the co-chair with me, a four leader. Richard was the chief exec of BCODP, the British Council of Organizations of Disabled People, the preeminent organization of disabled people in Britain. The DBC Alliance became a powerful lobby of government, regularly meeting government ministers and even the prime minister. I'll audio describe this slide where we, the DBC, are in the grand cabinet room of number 10. On the left of the table with a delegation of 10, four women and six men, five of whom are disabled on the front. On the right side of the table are the prime minister, Tony Blair, Blair flanked by his secretary of state, Harriet Harman and Alan Har Haworth, the Parliamentary Under Secretary of State. When the Mobility Allowance was replaced in 1991 by the new mobility component of the Disability Living Allowance, both people who were blind or with learning disabilities were included, a huge social justice success which could not have been achieved without the Alliance. Another outstanding example of successful campaigning in Alliance form was Rights Now, which coordinated the campaign for the Disability Discrimination Act, 1995. Three, third method, more charity publicity using edgy, rights-orientated content. In the 1960s and 70s, the most common form of charity publicity used soft images evoking pity, oriented to fundraising. The new campaigning style brought something much more blunt, according to Nightingale, a scope, for example, a scope campaigning advert, then the Spastic Society, had a strap line, quotes, neither public nor convenient, with a picture of a wheelchair user at the top of a flight of steps leading down into a public lavatory, public convenience. An advert I developed at Age Concern with our agency in 1973 was, quotes, punishing the old, a British way of life, showing an old man in obvious poverty grasping his inadequate cash pension defiantly with the acerbic strap line, the reward of a lifetime. I should quite say off script that um, initially the headline was punishing the old, a national pastime, but the chairman pulled it out, <laughs> said, said that was going too far. Such challenging messages were regarded as confrontational, verging on shocking at the time, but were consonant with the early stages of a rights-orientated campaigning growth. Here is an example of a rights-orientated method, a charity demonstration organized by charities protesting against the delay in the disability discrimination legislation, partly aimed at getting editorial coverage. You can see disabled people linking arms across Westminster Bridge. Every TV station had their cameras there, guaranteeing us good coverage. That evening, there was nothing on TV news. Why? It was the day the Berlin Wall came down. <laughs> Back in the early 70s, it would have been illegal for charities to organize a political demonstration such as this. Four, increased communication and publicity professionalism of charity staff. 
The campaigning was greatly helped by three professionalizing skill initiatives. Harold Sumption, a leading advertising executive on the commercial world, pioneered what became widespread advertising agency support of charities. He started with Oxfam, Help the Age and Action Aid. Second, commercial sector people started moving to work for charities in significant numbers. A study showed that by 1992, one third of senior charity managers in post were recruited from the commercial sector, in particular marketers and strategic planners. Third, the VMG, the Voluntary Movement Group, was founded and run by Philip Barham with monthly press and publicity courses in the 1970s, training over 100 charity staff a year, taught by Fleet Street journalists who would run one-day courses. For example, on such nitty-gritty skills as writing press releases and how and when to deliver them to maximize the chances of coverage, which in fact was lunchtime on a Sunday, embargoed for midnight on a Sunday, delivered by hand to the commissioner at each national newspaper and the BBC, then ringing the Today radio programmes between seven and eight on Sunday evening to engage the programme planners. Why all this emphasis on Sunday? Because back then everything was shut on a Sunday. The journal and little happened news-wise. The journalists were desperate for copy for Monday papers and Monday radio. One of our best and most regular trainers was Pat Healy, the social services correspondent of the Times. This method, developing and the standardizing the campaign product. In the 60s, the campaign product was seldom used, not least because there was less campaigning. In the 70s, it gained penetration and by the 80s and 90s, it was ubiquitous. Most frequently, it took the form of a published report of evidence and solutions, which had multiple uses. They were credible with the target groups, forgive me, they were credible with the target groups of campaigns because they provided the detailed evidence and arguments for civil servants, ministers, commercial companies, local government, etc. But they also provided a hook for radio and press journalists who could say, or write, quotes, in a report out today, X charity has blah, blah, blah. For example, Age Concern in the early 70s started producing the first time one or two substantial reports a year on which it based campaigns. Age Concern on Transport, 1971. Age Concern on Pension Incomes, 1972. Age Concern on Health, 1973. Written by Patricia Hewitt. Child Poverty Action Group was a field leader in terms of quantity and quality throughout the 70s and 80s, and I believe still is. Last methodological impact was from the European Union and Brussels. Arguably, charities were slow to see the campaigning importance of Brussels. RNIB was among the first, but was not active till the middle of the 80s. Remember, the UK joined the EEC in 1973. Initially, charity interest was because of the potential for grants and contracts, but very soon charities realized the importance of policy campaigning. The House of Commons Library estimated that by the 1990s, around 60% of UK government policies emanated from Brussels. Several social welfare charities had staff person for Brussels work, and by the 1990s, RNIB had three staff working exclusively with the European Union. Such were the benefits accruing to our campaigns. So now we come to the last main section of the paper. That's four if you're counting. The decline of legal and political opposition to charity campaigning. This section describes the attitude of first the charity commission and second government ministers, showing the state repression of charity campaigning. Back in 1969, the charity commission was forbidding charities to press for changes in the law or government practice, which is the heart of charity lobbying and campaigning. The Commission's 1969 annual report gives a picture of the repressive position it took towards charities who tried to change government policy and practice. It said, quotes, it is very unlikely that it will lie within a charity's purposes and powers to sponsor action groups or bring pressure to bear on the government to adopt or alter a particular line of action. There's not much left after that, is there? 
These legal constraints on lobbying and campaigning in the early part of this history can be seen very clearly by the most vigorous campaigners, such as the NCCL, now Liberty, Amnesty International, and the United Nations Association, having to set up two organizational arms, one charitable and registered, concentrating on education and research, and one non-charitable, thus legally capable of lobbying and campaigning. NCCL was not a charity, but its sister organization, the Cobden Trust, was. As Patricia Hewitt, the General Secretary in the 1970s, said of NCCL, quotes, I spent much of my time taking the subjects of our campaigns and translating them into genuine research and education projects for the charitable trust to use to seek funds. Some personal experience is relevant here. As late as 1978, I was meeting with two charity commission staff, one a lawyer and one a civil servant, sounding out their advice on the establishment of a new charity, whose purpose was to provide an information and coordination platform for the increasing number of actors in the generic field of social action broadcasting, telethons, children in need, volunteer recruitment. I was expecting an easy ride. Who could object to information sharing and coordination? But we encountered the opposite. The Charity Commission reps were resistant. In an attempt to retrieve the situa situation, I said, quotes, but it's a kind of coordinating body, like the National Council for Voluntary Organizations, end quotes. But here is the point. The response of the legal representative, but not the civil servant, was to say that that meeting in 1978, quotes, if the NCVO apply for charitable status now, it would not get it, end quotes. Now, this is, gives you a glimpse of the small c conservative nature of the legal section of the Charity Commission back in the 70s. I think the NCVO example was probably partly encouraged because it was a time when Nick Hinton, the very progressive new chief exec of NCVO, was reinvigorating it. Indeed, all of those examples exemplify a fairly common view back then among charities wanting to lobby and campaign, namely that the civil servant senior staff in the Charity Commission of the 1780s were marginally more progressive than the lawyers, who acted as, a, as powerful gatekeepers trying to keep charities out of the field of campaigning. For example, while the Charity Commission lawyers remained very powerful, in the 1980s and 90s there arrived a new generation of the non-legal, more accessible chief charity commissioners, Dennis Peach, Robin Guthrie and Richard Fries. In particular, Richard Fries brought in extra staff to expand massively the Commission's publicly available information platform on charities. This major additional activity diluted the influence within the Commission of the lawyers and resulted in charities connecting more with the Commission and vice versa. What was the situation at the end of the history, 2010? It was and is a very different one, one of permission, positive mission to lobby and campaign politically if the subject is within the legal purposes of the charity. D-Day was in March 2008 under the Chief Executive of the Charity Commission, Andrew Hine, who is here in the audience tonight, and, and the Chair, Dame Susie Lever, with the formalization of a new Charity Commission Guideline 9, CC9. In its current largely unchanged formulation, it says, quotes, charities can campaign for a change in the law, policy or decisions where such a change would support the charity's purposes. However, the meteor trail of opposition remains even today in smaller local charities with a not infrequent trustee comment made that, quote, we can't campaign because that would be political. If that was a view of the regulator, what was the attitude of governments, especially ministers, to increasing numbers of charities wanting to campaign in the 1970s? In 1972, Age Concern England invited the then Conservative Secretary of State for Health and Social Services, Keith Joseph, to address its AGM. The CEO, David Hobman, was frustrated by his board's caution on campaigning, as was I, his assistant chief exec, in charge of what was then called appeals and public relations. David decided to challenge the status quo and ask Keith Joseph publicly, having pre-warned his private office, if Age Concern England, a charity, could argue publicly against government policy. I consulted my opposite numbers in other social welfare charities, 
and we cautioned against this high-risk strategy. If the Secretary of State in his formal capacity said no, we'd be worse off. At the AGM, there was a hush as Joseph answered David's question. He said, charities could challenge government policy publicly in their cause area, provided that it was a considered argument and not, quotes, shrill, end quotes. <laughs> Age Concern felt this reluctant public statement of permission to campaign was so significant that it produced a four page monograph on it, which it circulated widely among other charities. It's interesting to note that negativity towards strident campaigning was not simply a conservative government view. Des Wilson refers to a conversation he had with Jim Callaghan while he was Labour Prime Minister 1976 to 79. When the latter reputedly said to Wilson, well, they were both Wilson, weren't they? Des Wilson. No, that's Callaghan. Sorry, I got you <laughs> muddling up my prime ministers. <laughs> Callaghan said, quotes, Shrill, single-minded pressure groups made this country much more difficult to govern. <laughs> That's in Wilson's book, 1984. So finally tonight, here are the conclusions I would draw for the 40-year period, 1970 to 2010. The number and range of charities adopting lobbying and campaigning activity increased dramatically. The volume also increased dramatically. The growth was fueled by a shift in social welfare charity attitude towards beneficiaries from welfare to rights. The growth was also fueled by the ideological opportunity, the ideological space and the operational capacity created by the growth of the welfare state and the anticipated transfer of services from the voluntary sector to the state. The charity regulators approach changed from one of not permitting registered charities to campaign and lobby to one giving it their positive permission, provided it is focused on a charity's legal purposes. A growing recognition by charities that their causes were more greatly impacted by the actions of other actors in the statutory, commercial, voluntary and informal sectors, rather than the particular charity's direct services. A growing strategic perception that amelioration on its own stores up future problems because the systemic causes remain and that cure and better still prevention are required. And two possible further conclusions not explored tonight, but discussed in Vision Changing Charity. From 1970 to 1985, the recruitment of a cohort of charity staff more comfortable with and committed to activism because they were children of the 60s. And a major real increase in charity voluntary income enabled charities to fund lobbying and campaigning because earned income can seldom be applied to campaigning, whereas voluntary income can. So that concludes my talk. Thank you here and at home for listening, and I look forward to your questions and comments.